Hello and welcome everybody to this last webinar of our EMWRE webinar series in 2021 on ecosystem services. Um, on ecosystem. So I'm Charlotte Berion, um, I'm a guest professor at VUB uh, and I work for a startup called WEL Bio, uh, where we use remote sensing uh, for water. So today in our webinar, we will as always have a short introduction to the project, the EMWRE project. And then Professor Hutas will present innovative technologies for monitoring species distributions and behavior. And Professor Homansky will uh, present monitoring system for riparian wetlands with use of eddy covariance and remote sensing. After those two presentations, we have time for questions and answers. So please, again, post your questions to the chat um, during the presentations. So now let me introduce you to the EMWRE project. It's a project that wants to create a new generation of decision makers on water resources engineering and management in the MENA region, mainly and elsewhere. So within the project, we develop a blended learning, so online, online and in-person master program with real world case studies and an interdisciplinary project. The project also favors the use of free and open software and open data to analyze and solve problems. Um, the partners of the project are um, two regional partners, so the Univ Islamic University of Gaza in Palestine and Al-Quds University in Palestine, as well as the Muta University and the University of Jordan in Jordan. The European partners are the Free University of Brussels in Belgium, the IAG Delft Institute for Water Education in the Netherlands, and then OIMENA in Belgium, well, Greece, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. The funders are the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union and the DUPC2 program from IAG Delft for Water and Development. So we want to thank them. And also our international networks, so UNESCO, IHP, Open Water Network, UQWARE, Furios, and VITO. If you want to stay updated in, on uh, what's going on uh, on the project, you can always follow up on the website as well as on social media. And today, as I said already, it's the last of our series of webinars and ecosystems. The rules for the webinar um, are that you should use the engage with the presenters in the, through the chat box so you can introduce yourself, but also please ask all questions uh, that come up to you during the presentations in this chat box. Um, there will be a webinar recording and the presentations will be available afterwards on the EMWRE website, so you can always re-watch um, the recordings are also on YouTube. Uh, for those that are interested in certificates, they can, as, can be requested only after participating in all eight webinars. And you should uh, register in the form that will be communicated in the chat box or on the platform itself. So please enjoy this last webinar of this series with us and have fun. And now let me introduce you to the first presenter. Um, which is Professor Peter uh, Huthans. He is a professor in applied water ecology and sustainable water management at the Ghent University in Belgium. And while he started his research already in 1996 at the Ghent University, where he mainly focused on consultancy for the government, and he became a member of the International Water Agency since 1995. Uh, first uh, in Belgium, but then he also became an International Water Agency Fellow in 2016 based on outstanding contribution to this society. In 2005, he obtained his PhD on the integration of informatics uh, in ecological river management and became a professor shortly after in 2007. 
He mainly combines fundamental and applied research with a focus on innovation of monitoring, assessment and modeling methods to support decision making in water management. And additional to his research in Belgium and Europe, he has also a long-standing cooperation with universities and governments in Latin America, Africa and Asia, uh, in particular related to the sustainability analysis of surface water and river basins. Today, he's going to present innovative technologies for monitoring species distribution and behavior. Yeah, please, Professor Hutas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, for this introduction. Good evening also from, uh, from my side. Like indicated, I will give some overview of monitoring species distributions, but also with a link to their behavior. So my presentation is built up in five parts. I will first introduce the need for information about species distributions. Then I will go over some different types and traits of uh, these different species. And then followed by that, I will introduce different standards uh, that are commonly used and their limitations. And what is actually the reason for this presentation, the innovative methods for species detection. So what I will cover today is a summary on cameras and sensors, tech-based tracking systems, citizen science, and also biotechnology. So in conclusion, I will draw so, some uh, take-home messages. So species distributions, why do we need actually this information? During the past years, uh, many human activities, like industrial activities, agricultural activities, but also the construction of housing, so the urbanization, has uh, led to many pollutants entering the, the river system, moreover also habitat changes that have occurred on these systems. So this had a tremendous effect on the goods and services, like for instance fisheries, that these river systems can uh, provide. If we zoom into this, we see at the left how these abiotic habitat uh, conditions are changing as a result of these human activities, and this results to a cascade of species that are disappearing from a system, sometimes appearing like some invasive species. There's new type of interactions occurring, uh, for instance, new type of parasites entering a system, new types of competition, for instance, invasive species eating many of the local uh, species. And this has as a consequence that the ecosystem functions also have changed. So for instance, this has led to less water that is available in a system. And this is in the end also has, uh, has a consequence for several sustainable development goals. Think, for instance, sustainable development goals linked to food availability, drinking water availability, but also about uh, biodiversity, life on land, for instance. So if we got this information about these uh, different species and their interactions, we can also better guide uh, the uh, restoration actions which are needed, protection actions that are needed to also improve the sustainable development goals. So this brings me to the different types of species that occur in water systems and their traits. So many species are known and we often think, especially in the context of ecological assessment, think for about, about the uh, water framework directive, we think about species like fish and invertebrates, uh, but also zooplankton, phytoplankton and plants. But other species like, for instance, microbes, but also birds, reptiles are often forgotten. So these are also uh, important species for the functioning of these, uh, of these systems and also their related uh, ecosystem services and the uh, related sustainable development goals. So as you can uh, notice, these species have very different sizes. They have uh, different capabilities for moving in, in the water system, sometimes also outside the water system, and they have very different uh, feeding behavior. Moreover, they are present in very different types of systems. Think, for instance, about lakes, ponds, but also marine systems, estuarine systems, which have very different flows, depth, and turbidity, for instance. So from that perspective, it's impossible to find one method which can cover all these different uh, species uh, to, to collect information about this different type of species. And that's also uh, has led to different standards that have been developed uh, for uh, detecting these species in the environment. As an example, you see here uh, a set of typical uh, uh, methods that are used for invertebrate sampling, invertebrates which are already for more than 100 years used uh, for, uh, 
for the detection of, uh, of pollution and, and uh, changes to a river system. Uh, but also similar methods have been developed for fish. Uh, so they are mainly used for surveillance monitoring in this context. The methods that are used are mainly used for uh, a subset of species, uh, so like indicator species. Uh, also, they are what is actually uh, detected in the in the field, in the river system, or in the water system in general is very specific to each technique and the standard operation procedure. So often standards are also developed, uh, like ISO standards or national standards, for making the operation as uh, reliable as possible. Um, but they are also used in a context of longer time frames and larger scales. Think for instance about the European Water Framework, Framework Directive, where we on a three-year basis, six-year basis, we evaluate systems to have an idea, is the water quality uh, in, a, in a river system, in a river basin uh, acceptable, or are there some uh, restoration or protection actions uh, further needed? So often these uh, techniques are also based on detecting abundances, detecting whether these species are present or not, but not so much on their behavior. For instance, how they move into a system uh, and uh, how they interact with, with other species. For instance, do they predate on other species uh, and, and with what kind of intensity? So from that perspective, there's a need for complementary techniques. So which offer a higher level of detail, a higher resolution, both in time and space. Uh, and that can give information, additional information on behavior for stock assessment, for instance, in fisheries, migration improvement, for instance, linked to the tremendous hydropower development globally. And then also, for instance, for new species entering via ships, for instance, or via aquaculture that can invade uh, ecosystems. So where you have also the need for very uh, in a very early stage, detecting these animals in a system to be able to remove them also uh, if possible. So this brings me to some new methods that can actually give a hand in these uh, new needs. And the first uh, technique is uh, based on cameras and sensors. So you have uh, cameras which can be placed uh, underwater, but also ob above water, uh, which can actually help you, it's our camera traps, which can help you detect water birds, but also mammals, uh, but also underwater, it can detect uh, fish uh, that are present in a system and also how they interact in the ecosystem. Additionally, these uh, cameras uh, can also be integrated in drone systems, drone systems which can be both aerial, uh, so used uh, above water systems as underwater. Uh, so the, the systems uh, above water uh, can, for instance, be used to detect algae blooms or to quantify algae blooms, to quantify microphyte growth, and also uh, early detect floating water plant invasions, like, for instance, water hyacinths, which are uh, often found in uh, areas like in uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, and Asia. In contrast, underwater systems, uh, integrating uh, cameras, but also with all kinds of sensors, uh, can be used also for uh, detecting animals, but also uh, recording the conditions uh, in these uh, habitats. So you see here some examples. Uh, you see here the reference also, if you want to further uh, read about this, uh, you can see what are advantages and disadvantages of uh, these submarine, uh, sorry, sub, uh, underwater uh, systems. Uh, sometimes submarine, but it can also use, of course, in freshwater systems. And in some cases, it are actually uh, systems that actually go over um, the the water sediment, so which are very close to the uh, to the water bottom, uh, and where can uh, specific conditions be detected. In some cases, the water is too turbid to allow the use of such kind of systems, and then uh, sonar-based systems can be uh, a solution. Uh, for instance, in fisheries, marine fisheries, uh, sonar-based systems are, are quite many years applied already, but also now in freshwater systems, in channels and lakes, they can be used to detect uh, fish. More and more, also combination with other methods and models, it's uh, not only detecting uh, fish, but also being able to determine their size, uh, and even the species can be more and more accurately be determined also partly be based on the behavior, the swimming behavior, for instance, or the location where they are found. So also there we see enormous progress during the past years in the applicability and the reliability of these uh, systems. 
Another method, uh, innovative method, recently based method, is uh, the use of tags and receivers. So uh, instead of determining uh, fish and the conditions at one certain location or set lo of locations um, and doing some uh, integration of such kind of data, it's of course very interesting if you can also determine the reason why animals move from one location to another and what kind of uh, elements are hindering uh, this kind of migration. So uh, also these tags, which are uh, in many cases brought into these fish, uh, but sometimes they are also on the side of fish uh, connected. Um, they allow to, for instance, to determine pressure, but also uh, temperature, uh, for instance. And this gives also additional information on why animals move from one lake location to another. So the triggers of the migration uh, is also uh, determined. A good example of this uh, and very intensive research that has been done on the species is the eel tracking. Uh, so eel is a migratory species uh, moving uh, from the freshwater system uh, as an adult to the marine system uh, for uh, reproduction. It moves uh, many uh, thousands of kilometers uh, for this. And during the past years, this eel has a tremendously, uh, yeah, undergone uh, pressures, pressures related to water quality also because of uh, uh, intensive harvesting, uh, but also uh, because of obstructions in the system, like for instance, uh, hydropower dam, but also weirs for water quality control, for instance. So this research, among others from uh, Peter Jan Verhelst and also Stijn Bruneel, uh, has a, uh, which is based on planting uh, tags into these eels uh, in the fresh water system and where they also then back uh, released um, and where a receiver network in the scalp system that you see here indicated with these blue uh, triangles. Um, this actually, this research has uh, enabled to detect new migration routes, for instance, but also determine why these eels uh, move at a certain moment. So what are typical weather conditions, for instance, or flow conditions that uh, affect these, uh, this uh, uh, migration uh, and also uh, what are typical barriers and perhaps uh, also what might be then uh, ways to reduce these barriers or to, to mitigate these barriers. Like some other, of these other methods, these new monitoring methods also have some challenges, new challenges related to data quality. So often these data need to be purified, uh, need some errors need to be removed. Um, and the, the, the processing uh, is based on models uh, and also the tracking then, the, the tracking uh, or the, the modeling of the migration uh, needs also advanced modeling uh, techniques to connect these uh, different uh, uh, monitorings of uh, of this eel in the in the system. So new challenges also from from that side. Another technique that can be used and which is also during the past twenty years becoming a more common practice is citizen size science. So where gathering of data can be uh, improved via, for instance, bird watchers, uh, fishermen, anglers. Uh, in this specific case. So because you have so many people, uh, both professionals, like for, think for instance about rangers or nature guides, but also many volunteers, also often volunteers with huge knowledge about uh, these animal animals or plants, uh, and who actually also are very much in contact with each other via social media. Uh, so uh, they also make, can make use of different observation methods. Uh, so this is also an additional uh, way to, to, to get uh, a lot of data about and very recent data, sometimes even real time, about uh, uh, movement of species or detection of species in the environment. Also there we have serious challenges for data quality and data quantity. Uh, a lot of information can come in, but uh, some cases it's about hey, there's a wrong identification ongoing. So also database need to be updated, cleaned up uh, in that sense. But uh, also there, in that respect, there are some opportunities to deal with these uh, uh, problems. For instance, automated identification tools that can be used via uh, by these uh, volunteers or by these uh, uh, professionals, uh, where also image analysis and also model-based error detection, for instance, where people can indicate it might be impossible that such an animal is, is occurring at a certain location based on early detections or earlier absences uh, or the conditions in the system. 
So especially like for instance for invasive species, think for instance invasive plants, invasive birds. Uh, there's uh, some interesting uh, control mechanism linked to it, uh, especially because these people are so much in contact with each other, uh, and where the reporting can go very fast. Uh, in some uh, cases, like for instance in terrestrial ones. Uh, for instance, bird counting and butterfly counting has been very successful also for the surveillance assessment. A last technique I will uh, say something on is a biotechnological approach, which is based on environmental DNA. So animals and plants, they release uh, systematically DNA in the environment, uh, can be linked to uh, body fluids, fluids that are released, uh, skins or skin parts or or hairs that are uh, released in the environment and where the cells break down and the DNA uh, is set free in, in the water column. And the advantage is that DNA, in contrast to RNA, the DNA is quite stable, can be for several days, weeks, uh, and it is uh, still be detectable. Uh, and it can be collected via water sampling as non-invasive approach. So in contrast to many other techniques uh, where you catch animals or remove plants and you even kill them in some cases, this technique is actually having hardly any effect on the biota themselves. So the challenge is to, to get insight in the distribution of this DNA. It can be that an animal has been there uh, some weeks ago or some days ago. So also there regarding accurateness, spatial accurateness, there are some challenges also because of dynamics in flows, dynamics in temperature and light that can also result in a higher or lower breakdown of this DNA. So it can be a, a very fast detection method, but also has uh, serious challenges regarding reliability. Nevertheless, based on also models, but also improvement of the detection technologies, reliability uh, has been improved during the past years, uh, and also the costs have been drastically reduced, uh, and also the analysis time has been shortened uh, substantially during the past years. And a cost project at the Aquanet uh, is a good example of a project that has enabled to improve this method by bringing uh, many experts together and cooperating to improve this method. Here you see an, uh, uh, at the left an, uh, a result of a review that was written by Daniel Herring, also with input from this, uh, some of these uh, Dianaqua partners. Uh, and uh, they have been uh, looking for the different types of biota, here the one specifically for the European Wet Framework Directive. To what extent the method is now already reliable and can be applied and where there are still some challenges. So it seems more and more like, for instance, for, for fish, uh, for instance, but also for some invertebrates, that the uh, detection becomes quite robust and more and more reliable. In our research unit, together with the Hohent, um, we also were able to improve one of these methods, uh, methods for invasive species detection, specific for crayfish. Uh, if you want to have more information on this method, uh, feel free to download uh, this paper. Like mentioned, these new uh, technologies, they offer opportunities for providing more data, uh, other type of data, uh, but yeah, we have restrictions in what we can use in the end and how we can store the information. I also mentioned the challenge of the data quality. Um, so, and also on spreading the information, new information uh, and how to visualize it. So there's our new needs for data warehousing. Where shall the data be uh, collected? Uh, where it will be uh, undergoing an, a quality control and uh, where some visual inspection, for instance, is ongoing and where actually the data are also visualized to potential users on websites uh, after polishing, but also perhaps uh, making use of a, of a dashboard, for instance. So there's uh, for sure new needs existing or, or uh, uh, new needs coming from these new data floods. Uh, also regarding the use of models for management, there a balance has to be found on how many more data are integrated, how many more processes are integrated uh, to improve the reliability and the applicability of models, but also to make sure that in the meantime, the uh, both the model development time, but also the simulation time is not becoming too high because then it's also not user friendly or applicable anymore. So there we also need uh, insights from modelers, uh, model users to, to Keep on uh, to keep an eye on this optimal range on what extra data, what extra processes are integrated uh, in, in balance with these new uh, technologies. 
So this brings me to my take home messages uh, on my presentation. So uh, there's a need of new technologies uh, for uh, collecting data uh, on, on uh, water systems to improve the evidence-based decision-making uh, in integrated water management and also sustainable development. Um, some new technologies are promising, uh, but also, uh, yeah, in the meantime, there are some challenges linked to it. So I gave as promising elements that there are more diverse type of uh, data available. Also, the real-time aspect is more and more uh, something that is uh, possible. But in the meantime, we see that also the huge amount of data, uh, the new type of processes that need to be modeled and integrated are leading to, to new challenges and also on how these uh, outcomes uh, are visualized and used uh, by uh, river managers, for instance. So this was my last slide. So I'd like to thank everybody who is uh, following this seminar for your interest and your attention. I'd like to thank very much the organizers for their support during the past uh, months. Uh, and if you want to have more information, you can find here uh, my email address uh, website, but you can also find me on social media like ResearchGate and LinkedIn, for instance. So thank you very much for your attention. And I, if like, I'd like to give the word back to uh, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Professor Hutal. That was very interesting. Thank you for highlighting all the technologies from sensors, DNA, and citizen science to evaluate and better help in, in water, surface water management, but also illustrating the challenges linked to all this data and uh, the liability of the data. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And let's move forward to the next presenter, which is Professor Homansky. Um, he currently works and is the head of the Department of Remote Sensing and Environmental Assessment at Warsaw University of Life Sciences. He specializes in hydrological modeling, eco-hydrology, GIS and remote sensing. He is one of the main initiators at the WLULS SGGW, so the, um, the um, uh, Department of Remote Sensing and Environmental Assessment at the Warsaw University of using drones in research to assess the natural environment the parameters and recently also for applications in urban areas. Um, he is also involved in the Biebscha wetlands research uh, as a participant of several Polish and international projects aiming on recognition of hydrological processes in wetlands. And today he's presenting a monitoring system for riparian wetland with the use of eddy covariance and remote sensing. Please, Professor Romanski, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, you can uh, listen to me. And uh, so, uh, yes. yes. So, okay, then I will start. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, I would I, I would like to present a part of our research, which we doing together with uh, different universities, but uh, uh, in uh, wetlands which are called uh, Biebrza, uh, and uh, the wetland and the role of this ecosystem. It will be a, a, a let's say first part of my presentation. Then I uh, explained a little bit my aside, so Biebra wetlands, which was already mentioned. Then uh, I would like to explain monitoring system, which we used for complex wetland monitoring uh, with, uh, let's say, divided into uh, uh, fluxes monitoring with remote sensing and also uh, the thermal data application. So. Uh, uh, very shortly and very briefly, wetland in environment it has very significant role uh, because of accumulation of carbon. Uh, so, if we look at the area of uh, uh, of the of the all earth, which are covered by wetlands, and uh, amount of organic carbon which can be accumulated by this by these uh, ecosystems it you can see that at least three six times more accumulation than than the, than the standard so uh, the, the uh, some standard land use uh, uh, types so uh, but in fact uh, the role of this environment uh, of this ecosystem in environment 
it also uh, is very significant and also the area the wetland area are very vulnerable for the changing of hydrometeorological conditions and that's uh, of course during our last days last years uh, where we we heard everywhere about climate change and consequences the consequences of climate change will uh, will be observed firstly in the wetland and we can observe it even now already now uh, by changes changes in water uh, uh, moisture uh, uh, soil moisture and water a month in, in in ecosystems in wetland ecosystems so that's uh, something would have to be uh, measured monitor uh, nowadays uh, in, in time of climate change so looking on the Biebrza wetlands uh, uh, everybody I, I, I have I have a look that you you are from different countries in all the world so I only say that which I not expected maybe so I can say that Poland is in the center of Europe so this you can find and in the Poland in the enemy map but in Poland Biebrza wetlands are located in the uh, north east uh, part so here you see uh, the river Biebrza is a river uh, and uh, river catchment in 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 red and uh, valley of the Biebrza fitted by 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 organic soil in a yellow branch so uh, the wetlands Biebrza is belongs to riparian wetlands so it means or marshes uh, riverine marshes so uh, in in fact we can observe uh, inundation and very high level of moisture during springtime wet time wet period in poland and uh, during summer uh, during uh, winter but during summer it's rather uh, not uh, it's rather dry so uh, the problem of existing here of ecosystems which are very very let's say natural uh, is to uh, to survive this uh, dry season uh, using the water and uh, substances which can come here to to them in during the flood flood time uh, but concentrating on the monitoring system the aim of the con of, of this complex monitoring system was to find relation between uh, uh, ghg fluxes uh, and which are important for climate change several of them uh, and to find relation between them and remote sensing just to because the, the why yeah, remote sensing give us possibility to make uh, 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 monitoring complex and uh, uh, continuous monitoring uh, of of these uh, fluxes. So this what we are, what we uh, investigate here is carbon dioxide and water vapor flux. So two of them, uh, which we try to connect to reflectance data, and uh, as, uh, let's say from other side. Uh, investigation of the thermal data and uh, relation of thermal data to ecosystem condition so that's uh, let's say uh, things which I wanted to explain you today uh, and we if we talk about carbon dioxide uh, we say about net ecosystem exchange and gross primary production uh, and water vapor plugs there are both evapotranspiration let's say evaporation which can which happen from interception capacity interception storage and leaves and transpiration uh, and that's there were uh, investigating of these two were the let's say um, um, the, um, the reason that we established uh, a decovariance tower for measurement of direct measurement of fluxes so several uh, uh, pictures of this tower which is called Zosia site located on the flat uh, flat 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 plain uh, with homogeneous uh, ecosystems 
on the map in this inside you can see that this homogeneously because of the let's say connection to electricity which is very important for this project it's not really uh, let's say 100% but looking on this 70% of observation uh, are stored um, on the let's say homogeneous area and can and from rest let's say 10% we can exclude part which are not really on the ecosystem directly. Uh, so a uh, little bit about the station itself. As if we talk about uh, this uh, topic, I would not going to tell about everything, but if we talk about this, so the main reason was uh, measurements of the, uh, of the water, uh, transpiration and evaporation. And also uh, uh, we, uh, Let's say a part of this is an investigation, part of this topic, of this, uh, let's say, reasons, uh, our investigation of the uh, leaf water storage, uh, interception, and trying to, to find relation between interception and evapotranspiration itself, using this complex tower for looking on uh, evaporation and interception. For this reason, we also use spectral radiometers uh, uh, to, uh, let's say, looking on this period from rainfall uh, to the complex drying drying of the of the of the leaves. So, but uh, and then from this we can let's say estimate the time where uh, evaporation is is finishing or is responsible for evapotranspiration. Uh, itself. So, if we talk about uh, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, there are let's say two things. One is net ecosystem. Uh, one is gross primary production. Another one is respiration of ecosystem. So, based on these two, we can calculate net ecosystem exchange to have information about uh, uh, how much how much uh, uh, CO two can be. Uh, assimilated and how much can be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sent to the atmosphere. So, and covariance, and the covariance, uh, it's the, let's say, the system which is installed on the, this tower, three meters of height, in which we uh, calculate the, uh, let's say, uh, Mm, direct uh, evaporation, direct flux of the water, and direct flux flux on the CO2 uh, in this uh, three meters of uh, of the atmosphere uh, depth, and and this is a, a direct measurement, not uh, uh, really uh, not calculation, but another one uh, direct measurement in the tower is uh, spectral measurements. Which uh, just here was uh, uh, taken by a set of the uh, ocean optic instruments uh, with the range of 400 to 1000 nanometers. Uh, both uh, were uh, measured in the same time continuously, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say two fluxes, we can say two uh, uh, energy. Fluxes upcoming and and reflected, and as, uh, except this, we measure uh, temperature. There is an ir, uh, uh, irradiance temperature sensor for uh, calculated cal calculation thermal flux, thermal temperature flux or temperature of the of the of the uh, land cover. So what is called usually land surface temperature. So several. Uh, results. If we look on this uh, time uh, of the, our realization of one of the, the, let's say, the first project, which was men was mentioned on one of the page before, uh, so the results of uh, uh, fluxes CO2 and evapotranspiration are located here. So in we can observe three, let's say, uh, seasons with high evapotranspiration, so summertime, and three uh, times, let's say, for uh, or periods uh, for very low evapotranspiration, 
uh, what is uh, uh, winter time. And also here, uh, you you can look at our uh, let's say distribution of fluxes in which uh, uh, let's say net and uh, uh, EE is the something in between, which is the difference between uh, GPP and RICO. So so that's the flux in, in in between. So which give us information about let's say the environmental uh, environmental behavior of ecosystem so there is emission in the in 2015 which was the very very uh, dry and very hot year and almost absorption let's say on the level of zero uh, in 2016 and uh, and 2014 before where the, the years were not really dry so uh, if we talk about measurement of the spectra uh, which we used later for calculation the range of them were quite uh, let's say spread you, you, looking on, on here on this picture you see wavelengths on the uh, on one uh, x and reflectance on another one so the reflectance can be is much higher uh, on the uh, closer to uh, let's say seven, eight hundred nanometers, but uh, uh, of course the uh, that what was important was analysis of the correlation between uh, fluxes and uh, wavelengths. And here you see uh, two uh, correlation uh, sectors. Let's say uh, for measurements uh, uh, aggregated to thirty minutes and to twenty-four hours. So. And uh, on the uh, top panel, you see spectral bands measurement measured by our ocean optic instruments. Uh, and uh, on the uh, bottom panel, you see spectral index indices calculated, let's say 40, the most uh, uh, known uh, uh, spectral index, which can be calculated for the range between 400 and 1000 uh, 1, nanometers. And most of them are uh, 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 narrow band uh, indexes. So looking on this, you see that uh, uh, the correlation coefficient for some of these spectral index are quite high, close to 0 0.8. Uh, for uh, uh, water and CO2, uh, and uh, also depends on the uh, on, on, on them. 24 hours is sometimes, uh, let's say, we see uh, better correlation for NEE, but uh, for 30 meters, better for GPP. What is also related to the time of measurement, and let's say, the phenomena of this. So uh, here you see, uh, let's say, several uh, indexes which were has the highest correlation with fluxes. So means if we have such a high correlation, we can use them for uh, interpretation, for the uh, uh, feeling of gaps in measurements, for uh, uh, for uh, remote sensing, upscaling to the all catchment. So and this is something what uh, is also done using the data from this this tower. And uh, I also mentioned that except these uh, spectral measurements from ocean optic, we can. We also measure it uh, thermal condition, uh, uh, LST. So, and we try to find potential for, of this thermal data for wetland monitoring, uh, uh, investigation by investigation of one of the standard uh, uh, index, which is called crop water stress index, using used uh, quite often for agricultural lands. The, the idea is very simple. So if uh, we have optimal condition of vegetation, we have transpiration. When there is drought condition, we have no transpiration and high temperature of canopy. So that's something what uh, uh, what is in the in idea of this, uh, of this method. And uh, for uh, application, 
there is some measurements which have to be done. We have to find the, let's say, the uh, reference curve for which we can say that in uh, when we change the temperature and it's let's say a relation between temperature and and uh, vapor uh, and this these two are let's say uh, air vapor uh, have to have some some correlation to from which let's say the the, the curve show us be, difference between good and bad condition and for 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 this calibration uh, let's say uav data was used just to validate it in the let's say areal um, method and here in the left on the on the right uh, side of the picture you see uh, the drought condition which happened in let's say on the b uh, picture so that's something in that we we see the the the, the problems and uh, uh, in, in relatively uh, good uh, and wet period, uh, it's happened uh, uh, when the water going down. So that's uh, something what was, in, let's say, calibrate for finding this uh, uh, this curve and validation with measurement of if uh, FAPAR and using uh, uh, camera from drones, the, the uh, thermal camera. Uh, and uh, let's say the continuous measurements for a few years and that's uh, then after this calibration we try to find application for data from from the tower so that tower based measurements of the lst was uh, related to lancet lancet 8 um, calculation so uh, cwsi was calculated for both of these condition and show us that for instant instantaneous measurements we have very high correlation and uh, what uh, also it's, uh, it's it's good to say and also uh, close to uh, noon mean they, they were also correlated with Lancet quite high but not as high as, as uh, instantaneous values but that give us possibility to uh, calculate what is the stress what was the stress the, in the years before during our uh, our project so in, only based on the uh, uh, the landsat what is on the right side right picture here so uh, uh, and let's say the method which was developed can be used in the future also for uh, application of this uh, uh, thermal index for looking on uh, water stress in the in wetlands. So here you if you see the the, the stress was let's say detected for in 2013 uh, in in August quite high and for the rest let's say it was closer to zero. What is also when the values are close to zero we can can say this is, we are close to the stress. The stress happened when the values are lower than zero. And looking on the correlation between uh, spectra index and uh, 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 thermal index, we couldn't find any any correlation. So it means that they not say the same things. They not showing the same thing and the same process. So uh, that's why we should analyze both uh, spectra index and also uh, thermal index uh, if we would like to say about condition of environment uh, uh, let's say more uh, looking on conclusion i, I think i already uh, out of time uh, so but uh, let's say there is one conclusion uh, analyze uh, data measure data measure measure make observation and monitoring to find relation between processes and remote sensing for using this in the in the future thank you very much for invitation invitation me for this uh, session and also for your attendance thank you thank you very much professor komanski i found it very interesting uh, it's really nice to see how you link the data you need to measure to get the wetland state of being and how you link it to remote sensing indices to upscale this to the entire wetland Thanks a lot. Uh, please post your questions in the chat. We will uh, now address the first questions. Um, 
for the next 10 minutes. So let's see, there is the first one from Ognan Mankowski. Can any of these methods for monitoring species be used in evaluation of fish passage effectiveness in small and large dams? So this question is for you, Professor Kutman. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for this, uh, this question. Yeah, indeed, it can be very useful. So perhaps you have also noticed there was a link to uh, a project called RIBUS, and exactly this type of methods, like these tagging methods, uh, are used for uh, fish passage uh, the effectiveness uh, testing, where we also want to investigate how the animals, uh, when they are coming close to the dam and close to the fish ladder, for instance, uh, or the fish passage, um, what is triggering there or not, and how this can be improved in case it's not working, uh, such a fish uh, passage. So text like like uh, uh, like I have shown can be used more and more also 2D, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 2D uh, modeling uh, can enable to, to have a more accurate view of what type of uh, tracks these uh, fish uh, are, are taking, but also additionally, uh, information from cameras which are placed in the river or in the uh, fish passage uh, can uh, can also be used for for animals which are not tagged. So there you have a combination of methods which is uh, is best in case you have the the funding for it and the uh, the, the mancraft for it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so another question from Precious to to a son. Uh, he likes to ask if, or is this beneficial in data gathering for envi environmental baselining for EIA reports? So, yeah, I don't know what the EIA reports are. I yeah, guess it's, you know. Yeah, yeah. it's an uh, environmental impact assessment, I guess he's a... Uh, or ecological impact assessment can be more specific part of it. Uh, so for sure, and uh, I think we need more detailed uh, data uh, for for many of these uh, environmental impact assessment reports. Uh, and uh, in that sense, these these methods can be uh, complementary uh, to to what is often available from surveillance monitoring from, like for instance, environment agencies. Uh, so and. To, to make a plea while I have here this possibility that these databases are also better used so that these data which are collected in a specific context of an environmental impact assessment report is also somewhere stored and can be reused in, in the future. But of course, it starts all with baseline information. For instance, before a mining activity is starting that you have very good data available, diverse data available on uh, all types of species that can be present, so not only some specific indicated species, that you have a better baseline available. And methods like the environmental DNA uh, can help you to have a very broad scanning of the species which are present before an installation is, uh, is uh, implemented. Thank you. There's another question from Jonathan Ruiz, Ruiz Delgado. For the eddy covariance data, you have problems with your data like gaps. And if the answer is yes, what technique you use to complete your data? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yes, we have gaps. Uh, this is normal when you uh, have uh, uh, data measurements. So always can happen that you have gaps because of equipment stops or uh, in, in our uh, tower, especially after the big storm we have a problem with the tower then we have to go and repair it and then we can have some uh, uh, gaps and there are also other reasons uh, but how we so this uh, analysis of the of the spectral data give us possibility to use them for for these gaps uh, uh, filling so this is what let's say first method and second method may be more easy easier we have also another uh, tower similar to our, our uh, in uh, Biebrza Wetland, but in a completely different place. Uh, tower belongs to a different university. And the, the, let's say the first step is to share data with them. With the, we have uh, gaps. And the second is uh, uh, remote sensing. And this method, uh, it can be just if the, if we if the simple correlation works, we use simple correlation for that. And this I presented 
If not, then uh, we we think, uh, or let's say we we use uh, a neural network or or similar uh, techniques. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ahmed Ben asks, can we detect a pollution in the ecosystem by measuring these indices through satellite images? Um, I don't know if you both want to have a short answer to this question. Maybe, Professor Schramanski, you can start. Uh, so it's not easy. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, it uh, depends on the which ecosystem you mean, because uh, if we talk about uh, uh, Oxbow Lakes, it's very easy. Uh, let's say you can you can detect in water uh, uh, also using similar set te techniques and indexes and satellite you can you you can detect it but uh, if we talk about uh, uh, pollution in ecosystems uh, yes also is possible but then the, I'm not sure it's uh, easy using satellite images because of resolution uh, spatial resolution and also spectral. Uh, it's very easy to, to detect them using uh, uh, field measurements, let's say using spectral, field spectral uh, radio, radiometers. So that's, that's much easier. Or drones, yes? Yeah, okay. Do you have something to add, Professor Hutas, to this? No, um, I agree. Any... So, yeah, some, some elements you can trace via uh, remote sensing, via satellites uh, or via drones, um, some components which are floating on, on the surface like oil and so on, this might be more easily detectable, uh, but others like for instance a nutrient release, uh, yeah, it can take several weeks, it also depending on the weather conditions, the flow conditions, whether you see a certain bloom, and then also the movement of the water in the meantime, yeah, might make it more difficult to, to link it to an exact uh, event and an exact location. Uh, so I would say, yes, in some cases you can, but also there are some, some limitations in terms of the type of pollutant and type of uh, system. Yes, thank you very much. With this, uh, we round up our question and answer session for this webinar. Uh, it was very nice to to have you today, uh, to have, have your presentations and, and your answers. Thanks a lot to the two of you. Thank you a lot as well to the audience. Thank you for following the webinar series uh, as a whole. Uh, it was very interesting for me. I hope it was so for you as well. And uh, we hope to see you in the next, in the next uh, webinar series. Thank you very much.